Hey guys, in today's video, we're checking out a new in-ear monitor system by Audio-Technica. This is the ATW3255. And yes, just like the thumbnail says, I am switching over to this as my main in-ear monitor system now. So it's built well, the design is great, the options are great, it sounds awesome, but there are two main reasons that make me want to switch to this system specifically. So first of all, when you do a scan with this, it actually shows you the RF environment. So it almost acts as an RF frequency scanner on this. Really amazing. I haven't seen that on any other system before without having to use some sort of software. And I love this because I can actually use this to coordinate my other wireless gear as well and see what frequencies are available. That in itself was already huge. And second, and probably the biggest reason why I'm switching is because if you've seen my channel before, one of the main things that I preach about wireless gear is the more channels and more frequencies that you have, the more likely it is that you'll find a clear signal. So this is measured in something called RF bandwidth or RF tuning bandwidth. That's just a fancy way of saying how many frequencies do you have available. So the higher or technically wider the RF tuning bandwidth, the more options you have to find a clear signal. So cheaper wireless will have somewhere between six to 12 megahertz of tuning bandwidth. Entry level wireless usually has about 24 megahertz of tuning bandwidth. And then higher end wireless gear usually has about 46 to 72 megahertz of tuning bandwidth. And 72 megahertz was the highest that I'd personally seen until now. This system has 138 megahertz of tuning bandwidth which means that it spans the entire UHF legal frequency range of 470 up to 608 megahertz. On top of that, it's a true stereo system. The earbuds that are included with it are nice earbuds and the cable for the earbuds actually acts as a double antenna for your receiver. You get up to 300 feet of range, you get over seven hours of use of battery. There's also a feature where you can do a scan and have one transmitter deploy all the clear channels to all of your other wireless from the transmitter as well. Pretty awesome system. There is one pretty big flaw with it though that I have seen from comments online. However, I did find a workaround for it. So be sure to stick around so you can find out what that is and find the workaround for it. So I do want to say many thanks to Sweetwater for sponsoring this video and sending this over for me to check out. All the opinions in this video are my own. And like I said, I've been gigging with this for the past six or eight weeks. And it is now my new in-ear monitor system that is going to have a permanent place in my in-ear monitor rack. So I'm going to go over the system in quite a bit of detail to see if this is something that you can be interested in. So don't forget to subscribe if you want to see more music tech reviews like this in the future. And let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so in the back, so you're going to want to plug in the power, and it does have the spot that you can loop the cable to keep it from being unplugged, which is nice, and you plug in the antenna in the back. This is obviously a stereo system. You have two XLR inputs in the back. They are only XLR, so if you do need to send a quarter inch, you'll need an adapter, and you also do get a loop out left and right if you need to use it. You also do have an Ethernet port here if you do want to use some of the software that Audio-Technica has or other wireless coordination software, which is also great. So here's the body pack. It takes two AA batteries. Go ahead and turn it on, and something cool about this system is that the headphones that are provided, the cable acts as a second antenna for this. So it's basically a diversity system. So you have two antennas to get a more stable signal. And the earbuds are dual driver earbuds as well. So they're not just cheap throwaway earbuds. Pretty nice. And they also do give you a case to store your earbuds in as well. Okay, so go ahead and power the device on. And I am going to show you all of the menu options that are available in both the transmitter and the receiver, but I'm gonna show you first just kind of some initial setup stuff. So your controls are very basic. So this is, your, this is pretty much the one knob that you have. Push the button and you can scroll through different menu options and pushing this gets back. So the first initial setup I'm gonna have you do is so push the button and then scroll down to name and give this a name. It definitely helps with labeling, especially if you're using multiple systems. Next, what I would do is I would scroll down to mode and are you using this in stereo or in mono mode? Most people are gonna use this in stereo, and I will show you here in a little bit how you can use one transmitter to send two separate mono mixes to two separate body packs. And the last thing that I want you to set up is scroll down one more to RF power. This was set to 50 by default. I switched it to 10 because the last couple of gigs I've been doing this, I'm not too far away from the transmitter to the receiver. The gig that I did yesterday, actually, I probably should have set it at 50 because it was a little further back. But if you're only going, you know, 20, 25, 30 feet away from the transmitter to the receiver, setting it to low should be fine. If you're going further, set it to high. So I have it set to low. And then one final thing, I don't know if this matters to you guys, but scroll down to utilities. And again, I'm going to show you all of these here in a minute, but the control dial, the way that this knob operates, it was set to default. I switched it to invert and that just made more sense to me. So if you find yourself messing with this thing and you're just like, oh, it's going the opposite way, set that to invert. That was my personal preference. 
So for the receiver, pretty simple. You have basically the same idea, set back and then scroll up and down the menu. So hit set and then you can scroll down through all the different options that it has and hit back if you need to get out of it. So first thing I would do is I hit set, scroll down. Also, I would give this a name. That way you know who's on which receiver. Next, I want you to scroll down to audio. Which mode are you going to be in? Are you going to be in stereo or mono mode? I will show you these mono balance and mix here in a minute. Those are both different versions of mono since I have the transmitter set to stereo. I'm going to set it to stereo. And then last but not least, I want you to scroll down again to the limiter. I believe this was set to negative 30 by default. I can't remember if that was me messing around with this before I did a gig with it and I just left it at negative 30 for some reason. But I believe it was at negative 30. That was way too strong of a limiter. I have mine set at negative six. So that's what I would recommend doing for the initial setup for both the transmitter and the receiver. All right, so for scanning, so this thing is amazing for its scanning. So I am going to show you just a simple method first, and then I'm going to show you the more advanced method. So the first thing you want to do whenever you're going to scan is you want to hold this back button for just a second, and you'll say RF off. You don't want this to be transmitting because when you do a scan, it's going to say that, oh, 530.850 megahertz is already taken, when in reality, it's just because this one is on, and that could be a clear signal that you actually want to find. So make sure your RF is off before you do a scan. So the scanning happens here. Push the set button and scroll down until you hit scan. So there's group scan and full scan. And you can also see the last scan if you have done a scan and you want to see the data. Full scan is the way to do it more advanced and group scan is the way to do it a little easier. So I'm going to do group scan. Easy method would be from the body pack. You would do a full group scan. You would assign it to one of the groups and one of the channels. So in this case, group four, channel six. And then you would go on to the transmitter and you would manually assign it to group four, channel six as well. That's an easy way to scan and that's pretty standard with in-ear monitors like this. However, the full scan feature is incredible and that's what I'm going to focus on instead. Go down to scan and we're going to do a full scan. It's going to take a little bit more time to do this, but it's worth it and I'll show you why. All right, so now it says scan results. Now it says push sync. So it has an IR port here in the back right here and their sync port is right here. So I'm going to push the sync and I'm going to put it right by that and you can see it is sending the scan data to the transmitter. Now it's done, and now this is awesome, so I get to see everything on here. So I can scroll down, so it says group one has four different options out of the 23. Group two has 10 options out of the 23. Group three only has two, so I'm gonna find one that has the most in here. So it looks like group six has the most. So I can click this, and I can choose one of these just by itself, so I can say, okay, I wanna assign this to group six, channel three, and now it's transmitting on group six, channel three, which is this frequency right here. I can get back to here by hitting the RX scan data. And the other thing that's amazing about this, so again, I'm going to go to group six, and what you can do is you can click deploy. And now it's searching for devices. Now I don't have anything else connected to this. But if you had other devices connected to this with that Ethernet port in the back, you can say, okay, it'll deploy all the available frequencies to all the other systems that are connected. That's awesome. You do one scan, from one receiver, send that data here, and then deploy it to all the other in-ear monitor systems. That's awesome, that's such a cool design. But it goes beyond that. So again, I only have one. Let's go back to this receiver scan data, full scan data, when I click that, look at this. I can see the actual RF environment. So I can see, and then I can move my cursor. So at 558.400 megahertz, there's a negative 86 decibel meter, which is fine. Anything below 80, you're going to be fine. But if I really want it clean, I can go to over here. So 553.600 is at negative 92. That is the least noisy RF environment. So let's go next. This one looks really crowded up here. There's quite a bit going on. Previous, previous. So there's quite a bit going on here. Most of it is fine though. And then I can go over to here and say, okay, nice. So 567.0 is very clean. So I've done this at shows where I've had a really bad RF environment. Anything below 80, you should be fine. But it was so crowded in the area that I was at. So I scanned from here and I was like, okay, well, these are the available frequencies. So this acts as an RF scanner. So I found different frequencies using this and set up my other wireless based on this results. That's incredible that this is an RF scanner as well. It'll show you the data on here and you can coordinate your other wireless using this on top of having the entire UHF frequency spectrum. That's really what sold me on this, but that's so cool. That's just, that's just amazing that you can see all of that. And then what do you wanna do? You need to send this data to your receiver here. So there's two ways you can do that. You can click here and you can scroll down 
to RX Sync, or there is a shortcut where you just hold the button in and it brings up this menu. So all this stuff right here, it means you're going to send the following from the transmitter to your receiver. What do you want to send? So obviously I want to send the frequency. I just set this to 6-1. I do want to send the name or I can say I don't want to send the name. I do want to send it. You can say the RF mode. I do want to send stereo, which is how this is set up. Or I don't want to change it on here. So if this is set to mono, then it won't change this. So I actually do want this to be in stereo because obviously I want this to receive in stereo. You can change the balance, the gain, low EQ, high EQ, limiter and stuff like that. So I could say I want you to send negative six as a limiter to here, but I'm just going to set this to no change. So what do I want to send to the receiver? And then all I have to do is go up here to sync start, sync standby, push sync on here, put it right by that infrared port. And now it has saved all of that information. You can see this is now set to six one. So that's a more advanced way of doing it. But to me, that's just such a better way of doing it. Because again, you scan from here, send all that data to the transmitter, and you can see the whole frequency spectrum to see what is the best channel. It's just amazing. That's just such a brilliant, brilliant design. That's really what sold me on this system. Okay, so now I'm sending some signal. So the next thing that you want to do is you want to scroll down to sensitivity. And you want to get this, it's nice that they give you that line of, as kind of a guide, but you can bring it up all the way to 21, which is way too loud. You should not need to go that high, but you have that option. And you can bring it down to negative nine if the signal is too hot. I found just leaving it at Unity has been good. Okay, now I want to show you how you can use one transmitter to send two mono mixes to two separate musicians, and they each have their own mix. They don't have to share a mix. They each get their own mix with their own body packs. It is in mono, not in stereo. If you need it to be stereo, you need to have one transmitter for every receiver, and it needs to be set in stereo. However, this is a great way to save on rack space, also a great way to save on money. So first of all, you do want to make sure that the transmitter is transmitting in stereo. It needs to be transmitting in stereo. You might think it's in mono, but it needs to transmit a stereo signal. But what you're gonna do is here in the back, musician one, let's just say this is your singer, is going to plug their mix into the left input. And then musician two, let's just say it's your guitar player, is going to plug into the right input. Singer's mix goes just to left, guitarist mix goes just to the right one. Okay, so now you can see that the left and right are getting slightly different mixes right now. So what you wanna do is this is gonna be your singer's mix. Remember, they're plugged into the left input. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go to set, so scroll down to you get to audio, audio mode, you're going to set that to either mono balance or mix. Both of these will work. So this is how they describe it in the manual. Honestly, just trust your ears. It will work with either one of these, whichever one you think sounds better. Now what you're going to do is you're going to scroll down and you're going to set the balance. This is your singer's mix. They're plugged into the left input. So you're going to pan this all the way to the left and you're gonna save it that way. Does that mean I'm only gonna get sound in my left ear? No, that's because you're receiving a mono signal. If you have this configured correctly using this method, you'll receive it in both. And now that one's done. Now for your guitar player, same idea, and you're going to set the balance all the way to the right and they will only hear what's going into the right. You do wanna make sure it goes all the way to R15 and L15, because if you're like right here, you're gonna get a little bit of your singer's mix in that case. So now this one is only going to hear what is plugged into the right channel. So there you go, one transmitter, two receivers, and a great way to save a little bit of money in rack space. Okay, so now for just the rest of the menus and getting this configured properly. So we've done everything in frequencies. You can manually set the frequency, or you can choose a group and channel, and you can see that RX scan data as well. Name we went over, sensitivity we went over, and mode we went over. We also went over RF power and the RX sync. So mostly we just have to go over network and utilities. So in network, if you are using this with multiple devices, you can give this an ID number and stuff like that. All of this stuff is for using some of the software or using with a computer using that port. That's not really what this video is about, but this is where you wanna to go to configure all of that stuff. So going here to utilities, you have a couple of things. You can turn the auto lock on, which is nice if you don't want anyone to kind of accidentally mess this up. This is cool, the group channel edit, is you can create custom group and channel numbers. You have a couple of different options. So you have six different user groups. So I'm gonna go into here and I'm going to choose number one. I'm gonna set this to 470, 125. And then number two, I'm gonna set this to 530, 250. And then the next one, set that to, uh, I don't know, 580. I'm just choosing random stuff in here. But basically, if you've used like an RF frequency scanner and you have specific frequencies that you want to assign these to, you can do that in a user group. You can also go in here and just reset it as well, which is what I'm gonna do. 
and now it's completely gone, but you can make your own user groups in here, which is really cool, but I'm not gonna do any of that, so I'm just gonna say don't save. Display, so what do you want to have displayed the biggest? Name, frequency, or group and channel? You can see I have this set to name, which I prefer. You get all three of them anyways, it's just which one do you want as the biggest? You get some brightness control, the control dial I went over. Access, if you have any problems syncing, it's probably because you don't have the set to free tuning. So make sure both your transmitter and your receiver are set to free tuning. If you are using user groups, you do want to make sure that both the transmitter and the receiver are in the correct user group. Otherwise, it won't pair properly. But setting it to free tuning should solve that problem. Preset is really cool. So first of all, you can factory reset this or you can save a preset. So if you if I save this as a preset, everything in here would be saved. And if I messed around with anything and I always wanted to go back to all the settings that I had this at, I would just go to recall preset. Definitely very convenient that they have that. You can also see the version that you're on as well. Okay, for the receiver, you can set the frequency manually as well in here if you want to. And you can also choose a specific group and channel manually without all the scanning and syncing as well if you prefer to do it that way. Going down, we've went over the name. We went over how to scan. Squelch is an important one for sure. So what squelch means is that if you lose the signal, so the RF signal strength drops below a certain point, what happens is you can either get a white noise type of pssst, type of sound, which is really frustrating in your ear. Or with squelch, what it does is it means if the RF signal drops below a certain threshold, either low, middle, or high, instead of getting that static type of sound, it just mutes the audio. That can be really nice. There's a fine line to that, usually saying that at mid is good. And then we also have audio and utilities in here. So going to audio, again, we've gone over the different modes, audio mode, stereo mode, and the balance. The gain, you can set the gain up, so by plus six, or if it's too hot, you can drop it down by negative 12 or negative six. So that's just another gain staging spot. Low EQ, you can do a high pass or low cut. So everything below 80 hertz won't come through 160 or 320. 320 would be pretty extreme. I personally leave that off. I like as much low end as I can, but if it is a little muddy, that can be helpful. You also do to get a high EQ, so it'll cut everything above 10 kilohertz. It's probably sloped, but it'll start cutting stuff above 10 kilohertz eight kilohertz or six kilohertz, which is really extreme. Setting it to 10 kilohertz might be nice if you're getting a ton of cymbal bleed. So I know I have a band where we have like four singers up front and just the cymbals, you can just, you get the bleed from the cymbals and all of them. Setting a 10 kilohertz cut can help reduce that. So that can be nice, but usually I leave that off. The limiter, just like I mentioned, I have it at negative six and then going down to utility. So you also have a lock on here as well if you don't want anyone bumping anything by accident. RF mode, again, if you are using this in stereo or if you're using that dual mono, two transmitters, one receiver, you still want this set to stereo. You only really want to set it to mono if this thing is truly transmitting in mono. So most of you want that in stereo. Level lock is interesting. So you can set that to on and then you twist the knob and you can see that it's changing it. So all the way up goes up to 10 and then down below sets it to two. So let's set it to five. Now it's set to five. Now what happens is if I try to change any volume, it says level lock and is always going to be at the same level. So it won't accidentally get bumped. Most of the time, you're not going to need to do that. You should have a way to turn up or down the volume in most situations. But in case if you need that, that is an option. Q mode is cool. This is something for engineers. So if you have a sound engineer, the sound engineer can quickly listen to like all four mixes and stuff like that. So if the singer's like, oh, there's something wrong with my ears, they can have one of these packs be in Q mode and have access to all four channels, go to the singer's in-ear monitor mix and figure out what's going on. You can set the battery type for a better reading of how much battery life you have left. The LED on or off, so see the green light at the top? Now it's gone. It's so small. I don't know why you would need to turn it off. That option is there. This is what I mentioned earlier with the transmitter. If you are having trouble syncing, you probably have this set to user group and you want it to be set to free. But if you only want to use the user groups, you would set it there. Most of the time you want that on free. You also can save presets in here. So again, you can restore it to factory. You can save all the presets in here and then recall that same preset, which is very convenient. And the last thing you just get to see a little bit of info and like the version that you're on and stuff like that. So that's all of of the menu options in the transmitter and the receiver. And hopefully that's helped you out to configure your in-ear monitor system properly for what you need. Okay, so for price, so this is listed at $849. You get the transmitter, the receiver, and the earbuds. That's a killer deal for having the entire UHF spectrum as well as having basically an RF frequency scanner built into that. This
This is definitely cheaper than some of the more higher end stuff. I think this is an insanely good deal for this system. Then just FYI, if you do want to get multiple packs for your entire band or for a church or something like that, they do sell a pack with four of the ATW 3255s. And it does include the antenna combiner system as well as the external antenna. So if you really want to take your in-ear monitor seriously for your whole band, you can get four stereo mixes or eight mono mixes with this setup. Going it one step further, you can get eight of the in-ear monitor systems. So you can use eight stereo or 16 mono at once. And also if you do want to purchase a second in-ear monitor system receiver, the belt pack, which I have, I ordered a second one, you can also purchase that. Purchase links to all of these will be down below in the description to purchase it from Sweetwater. Okay, so there you go. So hopefully you see why I like this system so much. And like I said, this is gonna be my new in-ear monitor system that I'm gonna use going forward. However, like I mentioned at the beginning, it is not perfect. There is one pretty big flaw in this design. But again, I did find a workaround for it. The flaw comes with racking this up in a rack. So first of all, it does not come with the BNC cables, which you need in order to bring the antennas to the front if you're gonna put it in a rack. This is a small pet peeve of mine. I do believe that if you're spending $800 on a wireless system, you should be able to rack mount it and everything should be included for that. It's not the end of the world. It's only like 20 to $30. So it's not not that big of a deal. However, if you've ever rack mounted anything before, you know that it comes with like a piece of metal like this, and that goes onto the side, and that allows you to attach it to your rack. And the reason you want to do this is because it brings the antenna to the front of the rack, which gives clear line of sight from the transmitter to the receiver. So they did give you the piece of metal that is supposed to go in here. However, what is missing from this? There's no hole. There's no hole to bring the antenna to the front. Just being blunt, this is pretty much useless. I don't even know why they threw this in here. I really had to look up. I was like, why did they miss something so obvious when everything else was so well designed? I found one comment on their website. Someone else was asking about the rack mounting kit. And the response to that was, you can drill a hole in the front if you need to do that, but you should use this with an antenna combiner. Asking people to drill a hole in this metal piece of gear that's that's just silly. To be fair, they are correct that if you're using a bunch of in-ear monitors in a rack together, you should get an antenna combiner to prevent an antenna farm with a bunch of antennas around each other. Having too many antennas all around each other is a great way to get dropouts and have less range and have more problems. But a lot of us are gonna be using this as a single in-ear monitor system. There's plenty of bands that I play with where each musician is in charge of bringing their own in-ear monitors and you, know, you space them out properly on the stage. We're gonna have a in like a little rack or you know with in a rack with just one or two other pieces of wireless gear two or three antennas in a rack is not going to be the end of the world if you do more than that that's where you start wanting to look into combining i hope if audio technica is watching this video by chance that you guys do fix this this is a pretty big flaw if we spend 800 dollars on a wireless in your monitor system we need to have a way to rack mount it as a single unit i do hope that gets fixed in the future however rant over i did find a workaround for this the company phoenix pro does make a rack mount kit for their gear and the holes did line up where where I could screw this in to this system and I could put it in my rack. You still wanna use the screws that come with the Audio-Technica system for the rack mount. They are a little tough to get in. That's another thing that they kind of missed with the rack mount kit, but using a power tool definitely helped. But that is the workaround for this and I will be sure to link to that down below in the description so you can get one of these for yourself if you plan to use this in a rack. It is also nice because you do have a way to rack mount it just as a half U system, which is great. So it doesn't take up a full U of rack space. It just takes up a half U of rack space and then you can fit another wireless in-ear monitor system next to it. And speaking of which, I will be putting this into my rack and I will be using it with a passive antenna combiner. And I'm gonna be going over how to do that in my second video this week. So be sure to subscribe to see that video when it comes out. So overall, this is such an incredible system. It had one flaw and there is a workaround for it. I love the system and this is going to be the new in-ear monitor system that is living in my rack now. How many times can I say that in this video? So again, many thanks to Sweetwater for sending this over to check out. If you did decide that this system is right for you and your band as well, the purchase links to purchase this from Sweetwater will be down below in the description, and I'll be sure to link to all the different combinations that I mentioned earlier. As of the time of shooting, it does appear to be back ordered, but you can still order it, and then as soon as it gets into stock, they will send it out to you. So be sure to use those links down below to order it from Sweetwater. So that's basically it. I hope you guys found this video helpful. If you did, do me a favor and just hit the thumbs up button. It does a ton to help out the channel and I would appreciate it. So if you are interested in how to set up an in-ear monitor system and run your own in-ear monitors as a step-by-step -step guide, or if you are interested in my compact and portable in-ear monitor rack setup, which now has this Audio-Technica in-ear monitor system in it, you can check out both of those videos by clicking the links on your screen now. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Scott Yule Music. Thank you guys again for watching. Again, many thanks to Sweetwater for sending me this to check out for the channel. Thank you guys again for watching. Don't forget to like and subscribe. 
and I'll see you next time. So I'm going to do that. Oh, God.